Um, I'm going to start by just showing a graphic here that is kind of a model of what goes into the interpretation of graphics that um, is based on data that's emerged from a survey study I did of teachers of the visually impaired and students across North America, and then the, as well as the data that I'm going to share with you today from uh, another study. But basically what we have here is a, a um, rectangle that says interpretation of graphics in the middle, and then four circles that point into that, that rectangle with the idea that content knowledge and experience um, applies to the interpretation of graphics, confidence and motivation of the students, the quality of the graphic itself, and the strategies that the students bring to the graphics. And then the strategies kind of breaks out into both technical skills as well as thinking skills. And for tactile graphics users, those technical skills are unique to the medium. So we're looking at things like the efficiency of hand use, tactile sensitivity, placing together parts to understand the whole, piecing together parts to understand the whole, place holding, and search pattern efficiency. So keep that idea or that model in mind as I um, show you some data and some results. Um, the things that come up as being related are um, kind of fall into this, this visual. What I'm going to share with you today is a little bit of the data from a Think Aloud study that I conducted. Um, I had student participants, who I'll tell you about in a minute, as well as their teachers and students of visual impairments who contributed by filling out a demographic form about the students. And I'll talk a little bit about the factors that were in that demographic form. The students were asked to complete five tasks um, using graphics. Um, four of them were related to math, so there was a bar graph, a Venn diagram, a rotation item, and a geometry area uh, problem. And then there was also a map that we had them use. They were produced by the American Printing House for the Blind um, to try to control for quality. Um, and they were on thermoform so that they stood up the test of time across students that I was working with. And then I had a version of each of these graphic types for middle, elementary, or elementary, middle, and high school students. So various complexity levels, but the same type of graphic each of the types of students did. The students were asked to solve multiple choice questions by engaging with the graphic. Um, and I asked them to do a think aloud while they were doing that. So basically I was just asking them to talk out loud about what they were thinking and doing as they were working with the graphic in order to capture some of the thoughts. Uh, it's not a foolproof technique. It's been used in other research, but it doesn't get quite at the exact cognitive processes, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that they're, that what's going on in their head as they're doing it. Most students were actually pretty good at doing that. Some students I had to prompt, so I would wait till they kind of gave me the answer and say, okay, what, what did you do to get that answer? And so some were a little bit more retroactive. Um, I also video record it so I could go back and just look grossly at some of the things that students were doing with their hands on the graphics while they're going. I can't look fine tune exactly what they were doing, but we looked at some general patterns that I'll share with you. And then the students were asked some questions at the end about their perception of the graphic, where they thought it was easy or hard, and if they could redesign it, what they might do. We won't get into that time-wise today, but what I'm going to share with you is um, some of the relationships between the variables on the demographic form and performance, as well as some of those strategies that emerged when we looked at the most efficient users of the tactile graphics. The participants in the study were 40, with 20 of them being tactile graphic users. I also had students with low vision who were using print graphics in the study. We won't talk about them too much, but they're there as a comparison. Of the tactile graphics users, they were pretty much split between schools, being at schools for the blind or being in public schools. The majority were at the high school level, 55%, and then 10% middle school, 35% elementary school. And then the majority, 75%, um, in terms of categorizing their functional use of vision, we're using their other senses in place of vision, with 25% using a combination of vision and other senses, but still being tactile graphics users. 28 of the students came from Canada, 12 from the United States. Now the demographic form asks the teachers to rate the students on various things. So the first was formal graphics instruction. Um, and then whether or not students had actual goals on what we call the individualized education plan um, in North America. Um, 
specifically relating to tactile graphics, and what their math ability level was. And we look at the tactile graphics column there, we see that about 74% were getting formal graphics instruction to some level by their teachers. Um, but not so many, only about 40% were actually had specific goals related to that in their educational programs. And 58% were rated by their teachers as being below grade level in math. Um, if you look across the column to the print graphics users, the low vision students, um, that's a, a difference between the students being 70% rated at grade level. Teachers were also asked to rate the independence level students had with graphics, the independence level they had with problem solving, and the success with tests and homework with graphics. Um, and so for the tactile graphics participants, mostly fell into the moderate category with some even spreads, 37% for independence with graphics, the moderate level, problem solving 42% moderate level, and success with tests and homework with graphics 47% at the moderate level. Um, in comparison to the print graphic, the low vision users were rated by their teachers um, more frequently in the high as being high rated as um, high independence levels with 70% in most of those categories. So they were also asked, how frequently do students engage with graphics? Do you think there's a difference between the print graphic users and the tactile graphics users? Seeing some nods, yes. So um, frequently, four or more times per week is how it was defined. Tactile graphics users, only 37% of the teachers said that they engage frequently with graphics. Um, compared to 72% of the print graphics users. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. We hear a lot, of, all, a lot of the other presentations about the importance of practice, the importance of engagement um, to increase decoding speeds and all other things. Um, oops. There. So this is just a quick look at the high school level of the graphics that I used. Um, uh, Having trouble here. Okay, this first one was a bar graph. It was a <laughs> so, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but it's it's automatically doing that's it's not the first level. See what happens. The first one was a bar graph. <laughs> was a bar graph. Um, can I just use the get back to these? I'll just use the arrow. <laughs> yes. I think in at the university I go through two or three of these. I always throw them when I'm talking. So <laughs> could be me. Okay, perfect. That's Weird. All right. I will describe the other ones. I'm just going to leave it there. Um, the first one was a bar graph. It had a uh, typical key, two types of bars with different textures, um, had guidelines. The Venn diagram had three circles with different textures, overlapping circles. The rotation item had a pivot point, and it was a um, a shape that then was rotated 90 degrees and the student had to choose the new position of the shape. Um, and then the area one was your classic geometry problem where you have a square with four circles in the middle and they have to find the area of the space in between the circles within the square. And then this was the map item. With uh, at the top is a large print version. You have five, 10 items on the key and one page map. Compared to, as you can see here, the map, for the tactual map, one page of the map, but in order to make it simplified enough to have everything on there, we have a two-page key accompanying it. So a little bit more complex. So let's look at the performance, the total number of correct. So there were 10 multiple choice questions we are looking at across these five items. And for the tactile graphics users, 50% um, got zero to four correct compared to the print graphics users where 50% were getting five to seven correct. We did have 10% of the students getting eight to 10 correct to the tactile graphics users. The other thing that's kind of interesting, the map item was challenging for both print and both the low vision students and the tactile graphics users. 
with 0% of the students getting all of the multiple choice items correct for the map, or 15% in comparison to the print graphics users. The other one that was interesting to me, because when I asked the students whether or not they thought a graphic was challenging or not, the bar graph, all the students say, oh no, that one's easy, we see those all the time, it's exactly what we expect, it had guidelines, it was well laid out, but only 10% of the tactile graphics users got the questions correct, all of them, for the bar graph. So there was something going on there compared to what their perception was of how well they did on that particular item. Time differences as well is probably not surprising. Um, average of 45 minutes for students to complete the five tasks who are tactile graphics users with a range of 18 minutes to 75 minutes. Now this includes them talking aloud, so it's a little bit longer than it might have been if they're doing it silently. And then 28 minute average for the print graphics users with a slightly short, smaller range, standard deviation of 9.9. So think about that performance, and we're going to go back now to the demographic components of that form, and I'm going to talk about the things that came up as significantly related to performance. So for vision level, um, as you might guess from the percentages I showed you, students who are rated as primarily using vision, so these are the print graphics users, um, got more total correct, a significant rate, compared to students using senses other in place of vision. There's also a significant difference in total time, again, between the primarily uses vision students and the two other functional vision categories. Math ability, also as you might expect, is definitely significantly um, contributing to performance with um, students who are related at below grade level were the ones that showed a significant difference in the total number of correct. A there wasn't a difference between at a grade level and above grade level. When we looked at the independence level that they had with uh, graphics as well as with problem solving, students who were rated low um, compared to high when their independence level of graphics had significantly different performances in the total number correct, as well as students rated, rated low um, and high for problem solving or moderate and high for problem solving. So problem solving in particular comes into play here. Um, and similarly, there was a difference in problem solving between low and high performers um, and the total time they took to do the task. Again, this kind of makes sense. If you're a good problem solver, you're most likely going to figure out that something's going wrong or something's not making sense faster and have a plan in place to fix it compared to um, students who struggle more with the problem solving components of the task. Um, when we looked at success with tests and homework and the frequency of engaging with graphics, those also showed significant differences with performance with students who were rated as low um, with their success with their own work with graphics being significantly different than those rated as moderate or high. And then infrequency of engaging with graphics was significantly different than and moderately um, than frequently engaging with graphics. So again, that frequency of engaging with graphics plays into this ability to be efficient and effective and quick with the graphics. Okay, those are the numbers. Um, <laughs> um, so based on this, what I did was look at the videos more closely of the students using tactile graphics who were the most efficient, who got the most total number correct, who were the quickest, to look at what they were doing um, and see if there were any kind of patterns that were emerging from what they were doing compared to students who struggled more with the task. And some of the things um, that I saw in my coding, students were efficient braille readers. Um, they, used, they used both hands for braille reading, they were contracted braille readers. They also use both hands when looking at the graphics, and they often did it for different purposes, depending on the type of graphic and the type of information they were looking for. So students who are less successful sometimes approach the graphic as if they were reading Braille, and they would go left to right. No matter what the graphic was, that's how they would approach initially each graphic. Whereas the students who are more efficient would you know, do, kind of do a scan, say, oh, this is a bar graph, and they would knew, then, then their hands started to separate and do different tasks. The students also used a way to hold their place when going back for the questioner key. So you saw that, that monster map with two-page key. The students that were not as effective would find something, go, ooh, what is that symbol? Take both hands off, go to the key, 
redone the key, then have to go and find that spot all over again. Whereas the students who were more efficient kept their place, slid their hand underneath the paper, looked in the key area that they needed, and kept going. Um, they also had other strategies that reduced time. So test-taking strategies, like reading the question first. So instead of reading every single symbol on the key before they went to the question, they got a general sense of the layout of the key and then um, went to see what they actually needed symbol-wise to look for. Um, and they double-checked. This is important. So the students, going back to that bar graph one that I highlighted, that students were confident they did really well on, but a majority of them didn't. What I noticed in the videos was it was the technical skills. It was the actual precision of the skills. It wasn't that the student didn't know how to do it. They knew how to go to the key. They knew how to find the correct year that they needed. They went up the bar, but when they went across that guideline, their finger dropped or their finger went up and they didn't double check or they didn't realize it and then they ended up on the wrong number on the y-axis. Um, the students who were more efficient were had the preciseness, had done it enough that they stayed on that line, and they also double-checked to make sure they stayed in the line. So they knew the places of the graphic that could hang them up or that might cause them to get the wrong answer, and they double-checked in those spots. Um, so I think that's you know, really important for us to think about as teachers in terms of the types of things we want our students to be able to start to recognize for different graphic types for double-checking. They could also identify when something didn't make sense and go back and figure it out. So they were able to do that monitoring, um, that problem solving again coming in. And they could accurately follow and distinguish the lines and symbols. So they were again precise at making those distinctions. And they had strategies to verify when the information was ambiguous. They also could break down what they needed to do with the steps. So in terms of their think aloud, when I was listening to it and looking at the transcripts of their think alouds, the students that were efficient would be like, okay, here's the question. I need to do this, 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 and this. And they, they, could, they had their plan and they went and executed their plan. Whereas the students who were less efficient were kind of like, hmm. And they kind of floated over to the graphic and some of them sort of just hoped that it would, you know, show up underneath their fingers. So they had less of a, a, a plan to execute. So... In conclusion, some general implications in terms of instruction that we should think about is to work on consistency and precision. Uh, so it goes back to that frequency of engaging. We, the students need enough practice with certain things that are tricky in order to get good enough at it that they don't get caught in what the technical skills are going to keep them from showing what they actually know with the graphic. And then to honor variation and preferred style if it's efficient. So when I looked at the efficient students, they didn't um, all do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. The general things that I told you they did, but some students, you know, used two hands more frequently for different things. Others kept their hands together more. There wasn't anything that was specific that every single student did exactly the same way on the graphic. But what they had in common was that precision and that consistency, and they developed their style well enough that they could use it quickly and efficiently. And then instruction that targets the tricky situation. So following that guideline or other things in graphics that students can get caught up on, working on those as instructors. Exposure to graphics, problem solving. Problem solving is a big part of it, figuring out what um, might go wrong, what, how do I attack this graphic, just that whole pr process. And one way we might be able to do this, I use the Think Aloud in a research perspective, but I also like to use it with students and have them talk aloud about what they're doing. It does give you a sense of where they might be getting hung up a little bit or where they're focusing their attention when maybe they should be focusing their attention in different places. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, you keep your headset on. I'm hoping there are some questions. Uh, so if there aren't, I, I could start with one. Okay. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, I mean, think aloud is, is sort of problematic. It can uh, be. Right? It can be, and it can also interfere, I guess, mm -hmm. with the problem solving because you have to sort of uh, split your attention a little bit to, to remember to talk. Yeah. It's not quite natural 
to talk to yourself. Well, it depends on who you are, yes. but uh, it, it may not be. Uh, so did you see anything yeah. like that? Um, yes, that was one of my worry, and it's definitely a limitation of the study. It's, you know, short of having MRIs and other things to work with, that's the best I can do in terms of getting at what some of the thinking is happening, um, but it does come with its limitations. There were students that were not phased at all. They just talked, and they just said, and you, you were just like, oh, what this stupid graphic, you know, just talk, 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 talk. And the students who were less able to do that, what I tried to do was not interrupt their process. So I waited until they answered the question. I didn't interrupt them while they were doing it, and then I asked them what they did. So I don't have as rich of data for those students, but I tried not to interrupt the thinking that was going on in their head without them verbalizing. So that's kind of how I tried to balance that issue. Do we have any, any more questions? Did you have any? I could just ask this one. This is sort of, I remember from my own school days, I had, uh, there was a guy in our class, and most of us, it's, it's like, you know, you can, as you said, you have a, you have a strategy, you can, you can, often you have to write down and you do all the steps, and you get to an answer. Uh, yeah, but he never did this, and he always got the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of Probably person. In his head, yeah, yeah, he did everything in his head. head. Did, did you see that? I did have students that did that, yeah. yeah. Most of them didn't uh, write it down, but they were able to verbalize. The ones that were really efficient were able to just sort of verbalize what they were doing, what they could do, and it was quick. Like they, they, they had enough interaction to do it. Yeah. Did you share your with your okay, Mike. And hold the mic close. Yes. Did you share your results with your students to get them maybe motivated to think um, more efficiently? Um, well, these aren't my particular students. My students, but I have shared the data with the teachers. So hopefully they are uh, sharing that. Yeah. Mm. I think I saw a hand over there as well. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, I'm also working in a similar domain where uh, we have to create experiments around uh, uh, contextual uh, diagrams. Um, and you might be aware that a lot of experiments, uh, majority of them do not use contextual diagrams. And uh, so how, like, how do you take care of uh, like biases related to prior knowledge about the subject or IQ or there may be other biases as well? when we are using contextual. Right, so the items that were picked were from a test prep series. So they were items related to things students would see on the assessments that they take in, the, in North America. Um, there were, and then that's why I was kind of looking at the relationship, the variables of students. Um, I didn't share with you, they also rated the student's level, their grade level, the, you know, what, what their academic grades were like, and so um, I can control for those things statistically. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I don't you. think, I think we have to stop there. <laughs>